Hi, and welcome, Freedom uh, Warriors, uh, on today's Essential Talks podcast. Uh, this is episode five, and uh, this is where you come for the conversation. You stay for it, and then you leave empowered. Uh, I'm your host, Jamie Russo, and my co-host, uh, Kimberly, uh, the lovely Kimberly. And today we have a very special guest, uh, Chris Waldorf. And, uh, well, it's Wy Weisdorf. Weisdorf. Oh, sorry, Chris no Weisdorf. Problem. Weisdorf, yeah. Yeah, so he's going to be joining us, and he's going to be talking about uh, some of the mandates and uh, some of the laws and that. Uh, you might recognize him. He's uh, also been helping with the Adamson, uh, Skelly and Adamson's barbecue case. Uh, so I'm just going to pass it over to uh, Chris, and he's going to take it away and fill our heads full of information. Oh, th thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I, I should first start out by saying that um, I'm not a lawyer. I, I there's there's I can give a whole introduction. I'm not going to do so. I as as Jamie said, I'm uh, uh, I'm involved with um, Adamson Barbecue. That is Adam Skelly's legal challenge is a constitutional challenge against the lockdowns and i've been involved with that since the beginning of uh, beginning of the year uh, january of uh, of this year 2021 i'm a, technically I'm, a, I'm advisor and coordinator of evidence and i was the one who got the six experts on that case we have 11 uh, expert reports before the court waiting to be heard we were not heard due to errors made by our lawyer who's long gone i'm not certainly not going to go into that today um but the point is I'm not a lawyer and uh, I, I sued the city of Toronto. I went to the highest court in the province. I'm still not a lawyer. So I gotta be very uh, uh, exact about that and explicit. So um, I should also just say like, you know, this is just, it's a simple uh, interview or it's a presentation, but it's, it's not intended to provide any kind of legal advice. It's really just used for informational and educational purposes only and is aimed at expanding your thinking. Um, I'm, I'm not a legal professional at all. So not a lawyer, not a legal professional, not a licensee. Um, and, um, and in general, you know, you should, you should just do your own analysis and thinking before asserting your rights, aside from anything that I present today. Um, always consider your own personal cir circumstances and, and really do speak with legal professionals. I mean, there are ones that really have not opined um, correctly or at all about uh, the COVID related restrictions. Well, but there are some good ones out there and, and you should you should talk to them. You should, you know, even retain the necessary for the purpose of uh, asserting your legal rights or otherwise. And, um, you know, none of this is, you know, can be understood as constituting as meant to construe legal advice. And of course, you know, no fault or liability may be attributed to any of us for the use of said information to assert your own rights. Please do so at your own risk. Very important. You understand that this is the most dangerous time we've been involved in with respect to what can happen if you disobey the law and and that's what i'm going to go into with you uh today to to tell you what the law is regarding um these restrictions I mean, mainly in ontario and bc i mean i can touch briefly upon other provinces um so uh, so the, the so I'll start by 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 first saying, I mean, the, the legal system in Canada actually is very fair. I know some people have ripped it, and certainly things have been very grim for the last 18, 19 months. Very, very negative, the most negative in Canadian history, no question. And so I can understand why people have lost confidence in the legal system. I mean, nothing has been heard in court. A few things have been heard. Um, things have just not not progressed at all in this country but you could look at the u.s too they've really only had one big win at the federal level and that was september 14 2020 so uh, over a whole year ago in pennsylvania so uh, people may rip the canadian system you look at the u.s system most of their cases the good ones have absolutely not been heard There's, they've only heard state level challenges not federal in canada works differently where we have superior courts and then we have the courts of appeal and the Supreme Court. It's pretty simple. In Can in the U.S., they have state or they have state courts. They have the state Supreme Courts. They have county superior courts. They have the federal courts. Um, and then there's their their district courts of appeal and the Supreme Court. It's it's definitely more complicated. And our, their system is a lot older than ours because our system originated in 1867 and then. 
Um, a lot of stuff was modernized with the charter in 1982. So not you know, a lot of the stuff is, is pretty new, but it goes in this British common law doctrine tradition and practice. So I got to be clear that we have a very solid legal system. The reason why we're in the trouble that we're in right now is because the laws are simply not being followed. They're not being enforced. Certain laws are being enforced. <clears throat> so there's selective enforcement. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, some people might say COVID is coming up. <laughs> so um, anyway, so yeah. That, so anyway, um, so with respect to the law, we have not, we've selectively enforced the law. Some laws have been enforced. Other laws have not been enforced. Longstanding laws that we know and we've long used are just, they've disappeared. Other new laws and really subordinate laws made under these statutes, these, these acts that were passed, that were passed by the legislature going through a rigorous process um, are, are essentially the law of the land. They're all done provincially, not federally. That's another thing. Um, if you look at the most countries in the world, Canada and U.S. are outliers. You look at Australia, New Zealand, U.K., which are British common law jurisdictions. There are other ones as well. And, and, and they've done a lot of stuff at the federal level, not at the provincial level, not, the, not below the federal government. And and so essentially, there's like a central government dictating, and and they can't they can't defy that. And then they don't have a, they don't have a bill of rights like Canada. We have the Charter of Rights. We also have a Canadian Bill of Rights. We have bills of rights. That's for federal only. The Charter of Rights is for all government in Canada, no matter what any kind of emanation of government, anything that's controlled by government in any kind of significant degree. The Charter applies. Um, in the United States, they have the Bill of Rights from 1791. So um, you look at these and you can see the protections, and they're very strong. The U.S.'s protections have been weakened since 1982 when the Charter coincidentally came into effect and divorce here. Um, they, they came up with their Qualified Immunity Doctrine from the, from the Supreme Court, um, which allows government officials, this could be any government official, it's really been applied to the police mainly, but it's to all officials because it was dealing with Nixon and all that sort of stuff, the fallout from years later. And, um, and this allows people to say that they were acting in good faith in, in enforcing the law, in the law and therefore they're not, they're not uh, to be held personally responsible for, for violating law if, if the law was violated. And, and this is really being twisted over the last 40 years as a result of that. We don't have that in Canada. We, there is some immunity in our pro provincial police acts. In, in Ontario, it's called the Police Services Act. But, but there's definitely more liability in Canada. And we, the reason why is because we have something in Canada that no one else has. And I, this, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to move past all this, but just to understand that we, the kind of power we have in this country, people do not realize the type of power we have. We've given up our power um, with, without a, any kind of real, in many cases, no real threats at all. We just gave up our power, no threats. Now the threats are coming after an 18, 19 months, but, but we, we gave up our power previous to that. The, the people who are listening to this may have probably not given up their power, but most people have, and that's what counts, unfortunately. And um, what we have uh, constitutional damages in our charter, it's at the, the, the Supreme Law of Canada. They don't have that in the U.S. It's, it's in the 1871 Civil Rights Act. It's at, called Section 1983, Title 42 of their U.S. Code. code. Uh, you know, all that means is the courts look at this stuff and they're like, well, it's not constitutional law, so we can kind of limit it. And they did in Canada, we did that with the Bill of Rights. The Supreme Court did that. They limited the Bill of Rights. And it only applies in a federal context, but even there, they've limited its application. In, in Alberta, they limited the application of the Alberta Bill of Rights, saying due process means anything the legislature does or says. So there, there are some real issues there. But the Charter is supreme. Of course, they get out of that with Section 1. So... So to be clear about all this, and that's confusing, to be clear, um, our legal system does make sense. It is logical. It is more or less, I mean, especially compared to the vast majority of the rest of the world, almost the, the entirety of the rest of the world is pretty fair and just, but it's been 
you know, it's been very dark. It's been completely lawless for the most part over the last year and a half. Um, and and I, there, there's no better term but lawlessness because the law is clear. It's not being followed. It's being selectively enforced. The police don't know what the law is either. They're told to enforce a set of laws that is not necessarily legal, but they're not lawyers. They're there to just enforce what's on the page. They're being told different things about Section 1, seeing reasonable limits in a free and democratic society prescribed by law. That's sort of the weasel clause of the charter. But but you could look at BC where it was used against protesters. They won. The protesters, everyone else lost, but the protesters won, saying that then in the COVID era, no protesting rights may not be limited. Didn't work in Alberta. It, you know, go figure. But um, yeah, so in terms of the law, it does make sense. It's not being properly applied. It's being selectively applied. Looking at what our entire legal system is based upon. Um, so just in, in, if you haven't ever thought about it before, and I've done a great deal of thinking about this, there's a work called um, The Law by uh, Carl Frederick Bastiat, B A S T I. A.T. Bastiat from 1849, so 170 years ago, and um, and he talks about why the law exists, and 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 truly the the reason why government came into existence, why there's a legal system, is to protect life, liberty, and property. It didn't come into being in some sort of a vacuum. It came into being to protect people, right? So. I mean, at the time, you know, there, they didn't even have, they had guns, but they didn't, even, they didn't have revolvers back then. They, they didn't really have very much to protect themselves with. So they, they kind of relied upon some, you know, some kind of, you know, collectively funded apparatus, which would be the government to protect them. And then they had the Bill of Rights and all this stuff. And even in Canada, we had the, we had the um, uh, 1867 Constitution Act. And there's no Bill of Rights in there, but I mean, it goes through British common law doctrine, tradition, and practice over centuries. So we, I mean, we're very, very fortunate to be under that system because we have all these protections and you can't just suddenly just snap your fingers and then in like literally a month, all our rights are gone. Sorry, that's not how the system works. That's what they, they want that to exist, the people who want to destroy our country and our legal system and Western democracy and freedom. They want that, but unfortunately can't have it. And the courts right now, yeah, they're bending to this because no one's really challenged this stuff in court except us. We have those 11 extra reports. They will be heard, but until they're heard and decided upon, um, until someone else comes up with a similar challenge with expert evidence and really takes a run at every single tenant of the narrative, this will continue. Because the, the courts, I mean, the Supreme Court, I don't think it's any secret. The Supreme Court has just ordered its administrative personnel to to have the vaccination. I mean, that's, so that's very dark. And people are like, well, why bother? And I can tell you, because no one's, no one's bothered trying. The only evidence, the only cases that have been heard in court thus far in this country are ones without evidence or with very weak evidence. So the ones that with good evidence, they don't get heard. So, um, I'm not going to go into that, but uh, um, what I what I was saying about um, our legal system, life, liberty, and property, at the, at you know what secures those things? What what ultimately you know is it a bill of rights or something like that? Because we didn't have anything like that until very recently. The bill, Canadian Bill of Rights is from 1960. The Charter of Rights is from 1982. Well, what did we have before that? We had this British common law doctrine, tradition, and practice. So, what does that entail? Well, one of those is the integrity of the ind individual, bodily autonomy and consent. Our system, our legal system, the, the very basis of the legal system, I mean, I can mention property rights as well, but the basis of the legal system is to, is to protect your like, life and, and liberty. So, you know, if someone touches you, does something to, you, to your body, bodily integrity without your, without your consent, that is an assault, and that has been held to be an assault for centuries. Now they're just trying to, oh, it doesn't exist anymore. Like, for what? There is no law that can supersede that. The Supreme Court has weighed in on that many times. Um, our Court of Appeals weighed in. I have not looked at what the BC Court of Appeal has, has opined, but I'm sure it's the same kind of thing. 
Um, the the criminal code is very explicit about this, and of course, you I mean you have your um, your own consent legislation as Ontario does. So, so at the but at the heart of this, the, the the legal system is this this a bod bodily and autonomy and consent, and the consent is something where if you sign a contract, for instance, I mean the, the very basis of of the um, let you know legal system is this is with is with consent and with consent um with a contract for instance as i mentioned if you sign a contract and your consent is in question so if the contract is taken to court and it's determined that there was coercion or duress meaning you're under some sort of pressure not necessarily threatened with you know any kind of physical action but there was something that per, that compromised your consent the the contract will be deter will be determined to be invalid, and 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 so with respect to the contract signed with Big Pharma over this stuff, I think down the road a few years from now they'll all they'll all be determined to be invalid, and there will be they'll be sued out of existence like like Purdue Pharmaceuticals was with with respect to um, oxycodone, but I mean that's years down the road. Of course, the they'll take the money and run. The money will be long gone. But that's that, that's what I think is the exercise now. Um, but the point is any contract, whether it's with you or big pharma or, uh, the, a union or any kind of corporation, other corporation, um, is something that must be done voluntarily. There cannot be duress or coercion. The same thing goes for medical treatment. The same thing goes for anything involving your privacy, which is defined by the province is that, and there's federal privacy legislation as well, where, any private medical information or any information involving financial information or any other type of personal information, but especially with financial or health information is sacred according to the provinces and the federal government. And they, they really define the consent very clearly and they're in many ways they're obsessed with consent. So all of a sudden consent is gone over the last four weeks. I don't think so. It's in the provincial legislation. It's in the common law, meaning defined by the courts. It's in federal legislation. It's in the criminal code. Uh, and and um, I don't think I'm forgetting anything there. Oh, well, I, I can also add in, in terms of um, civil remedies, like for a lawsuit, when damages result, when your rights are violated in some way, there would be some, I guess the three main ones would be for civil fraud, civil negligence or negligent misrepresentation or gross negligence. Those are the three ones. Again, they have to. There has to be one of those things proven. You have to rely upon one of those things, and then you have to sustain damages. So you have to, you have to be able to prove it. But but essentially, there's there's civil liability there as well. And then and and even on top of that, there's the human rights code. Depending on where you are, um, every province has a human rights code. The federal government has a human rights code. There's human rights codes. Uh, privacy legislation, uh, public health acts, and emergency acts in every single province. So to be clear, I mean, it, and, it, and all of this is not being done by the, it's not being done by the federal government, it's being done by the provincial governments. I know some people, there's some confusion. I don't, I don't know why there's confusion about the Emergencies Act. People want to quote the Emergencies Act. I'm like, stop right there. Like, I, I just, you know, I can't hear it because the Emergencies Act has never been invoked. One guy stopped it on, on March 23rd, 2020. One man, if you don't think one man can be, make a difference, you're wrong. One man, Scott Reed, the MP for Kingston in Ontario, for all of Canada, he showed up. Everyone was told to st stay home so that they could form a quorum. That's the minimum amount of people needed to um, invoke the Emergencies Act or you know, pass a statute or whatever. And they, they had, it was in this case, it was to invoke the Emergencies Act. They were told to stay home to solidify this power grab from, from the prime minister, the current conservative leader, federal conservative leader, wanted to invoke the Emergencies Act a whole week before they tried to invoke it, just so you understand what the quote unquote opposition is. So um, this, there was a, a concerted effort to um, make the, prime minister effectively the dictator of canada and that's not not at all overstating that the emergencies act 
allows the prime minister and cabinet to act like dictators if it's invoked. One guy showed up, Scott Reed. He said there's going to be debate because it's a minority parliament. They couldn't invoke it. So everything is has been done at the provincial level, and as I said, every every one of the um, pro provincial legislatures has enacted their emergency legislation or has used some met, some combination of the emergency legislation, public health legislation. And in the case of BC and Ontario, we have our own separate coronavirus legislation. Yeah, it's called the Reopening Ontario Act here. I believe it's called the COVID-19 Measures Act in BC. So that's a separate thing. Um, a lot of these... Um, uh, laws are being done with be, via executive decree, which, by the way, is legal. I know they challenged that in Alberta, saying it's not legal. They lost. The, you will not win on that. If the legislature confers authority to delegate authority to one person or a group of people, whether it's the cabinet, the minister of health, the premier, um, or some some other, you know, it could be anyone really. Um, that they choose, that they delegate the powers to, unfortunately, that person or persons will have that power. So in, in the case of um, in BC, the powers were delegated by the legislature through the Public Health Act, I believe it's Section 53, which says emergency powers. And uh, whatever the public chief medical officer of health says goes, they can supersede privacy legislation in BC. In Ontario, they can't. They're, they've tried to. Uh, people are kind of falling for it, but they can't do that in Ontario. The legislature said the opposite, that you cannot go around privacy legislation. There's consent that's needed. It's more ambiguous in the public health legislation, the Public Health Act in BC. So, um, but but it is according to what the legislature says as, and, the, and according to how the courts have interpreted things over, you know, the last few decades so since the charter was enacted. Um, any legislature or parliament or the parliament may make or unmake the laws as they see fit as long and they can be as draconian as imaginable as long as they comport with the charter and the and the law in general i mean they they have to make sense like with they have to be harmonious with the law that exists can't really conflict with the law or or you 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 end up in a, with a situation where the law can be inoperable so that's where we are today in in terms of um well what do we have in Ontario and BC, which would allow you as a business owner, or I'll start with just an ordinary person um, to, to assert their rights. So the first thing I would say is with respect to not the government, but with respect to private businesses, forget about the charter, forget about the Canadian Bill of Rights. They don't apply at all. Bill of Rights doesn't apply outside of a federal context, so it would apply at the border. It, people should absolutely plead the Quarantine Act, sections 14 and 32, in the Bill of Rights, sections 1A and B and 2A to E, um, at at the border, as well as the Charter, sections 2, 7, 8, and 9. So hopefully just rewind that. <laughs> but that's uh, those are things that are very applicable at the border. There was a case, a federal court case, which wasn't tried properly at all, in my opinion. They didn't bring any experts. They didn't plead the Bill of Rights properly. They didn't be plead the Quarantine Act properly, and they lost, and that's going to the Federal Court of Appeal, and I'm sure they'll lose there too. Um, and that's very negative, but nevertheless, it doesn't matter because you can still assert those those acts. Those acts are still there, just the, just because the court interpreted, it didn't even want to interpret them because they didn't try them properly, doesn't mean that you you suddenly lost rights. The rights are still there. So, um, in terms of uh, Federally, you can plead the Charter and the Canadian Bill of Rights because you're dealing with the border and that sort of stuff. But outside of that context, outside of the government context, if you work for the government, great. You can cite the Charter uh, or federal government. You know, let's say you work for the Department of National Defense. You can cite the Charter and the Bill of Rights. You can cite both of them. Outside of that, if you're dealing with a private business, forget it. Just literally forget it. Do not even think about it. But there are plenty of laws that we have that we can cite, and um, and and as so I've given you an overall framework of how the provinces have delineated their powers, their legislative powers, and 
and then how those powers in turn have been delegated to different officials like like Bonnie Henry and like Kieran Moore here, the chief medical um, dictators as we have them. The point is that you you have to look at what powers have been delegated to them and are they exercising them properly. Unfortunately, with with the the issue the issue with with um, BC is that the chief medical officer of health has more has more power with respect to being able to exert these these emergency powers in in in, in Ontario does they don't have them, but there they do have them. So with respect to how the uh, these powers have been have been exercised. You can look at the other laws. You could look at the enabling statutes. You can look at the Public Health Act in BC. You could look at the Health Protection and Promotion Act in Ontario. Unfortunately, in BC, there's this section 53 and there's other sections around there which talk about emergency measures and saying that the that that they can get around the um, the, the privacy legislation, but the but the consent legislation cannot be gotten around. There's nothing in there that says the consent legislation in any way can be overridden. That is absolutely unequivocal, um, and there's no way anyone can look at it differently. That informed consent is informed consent. They can play games with the privacy laws in BC and only in BC, but not but not here. So in BC. You can still not comply. I, I wouldn't, but um, definitely your strength in BC lies with the with the consent legislation. It's called the. I will tell you exactly what it's called. Um, it's the uh, healthcare, and then in brackets consent and care facility in brackets admission act. Um, maybe I I'll, I'll, I will just uh, copy this in and put it in the chat window. So that you so that you can actually it can be relayed later, um, and and this act is the key with respect to um, what rights that you have in BC to say that um, um, that the, that informed consent is needed, and you can't get around informed consent. So that's absolutely vital for you to understand and to cite, um, and specifically the sections would be I might as well give you the sections. Um, it would I'll just post it here because I just did this earlier today luckily and so I'm ready to go um, so I will just put them here so sections four six and nine of this um, health care consent and care facility admission mission act but there's some brackets in there I don't know why they put these bra idiot brackets in there but anyway it is it's, yeah, it's a little bit harder to look up so I would use that in, in BC yeah go on please um, now, um, a lot of people, I think the reason why they're confused is they don't, they believe that everything that's coming down is, is fully and 100% legitimate when you, we know that this is all an experiment and uh, mm -hmm. definitely consent makes the law. There is another area, the Black Law Dictionary, that talks about that. They call it consens uh, consensus fiat legi, which means uh, consent makes the law. So, and then when you're when you're in an experiment uh, through the Nuremberg Code, which is also international, um, you definitely have to have fully informed consent, which none of us have had. Okay, well, yeah, with respect to the Nuremberg Code, I guess Canada would be a signatory to that, but but the legislatures aren't. So your ver our versions of of the Nuremberg Code are embedded in this in BC it's the, this Healthcare Consent and Care Facility Admission Act and in Ontario it's the Healthcare Consent Act sections uh, ten and eleven really eleven would be for the Healthcare Consent Act for Ontario that's our version to to give you an example of how you know like Texas you would think free Texas right they have a lot of freedom there well no. Um, people don't realize all these healthcare workers were fired there. I believe it was a couple of months ago. They took it to court, saying that there's the Nuremberg Code and their informed consent was completely violated by the hospital, which fired them, and they lost because the judge said Texas is not a signatory to the Nuremberg Code. Sorry, the United States may be, but Texas isn't. So it's very important to realize that that you have to look at the provincial legislation or state level le legislation in the U.S. to see if there's informed consent or not. And, and then there's a whole other thing with respect to the government, but it depends on what if the government's involved or not. I mean, in the U.S., the, their hospitals are private. 
here our hospitals are public so if the hospital violates your rights you have the charter in in texas you don't you don't have the bill of rights or any of that you don't have the right so that is a problem that is a serious problem in different states in the u.s where in many cases they have less rights than we do we have a lot of rights here we just don't use them <laughs> we're just not aware of them we don't use them so um so the strongest legislation in bc is this for with respect to combating any vaccination mandates of any kind it doesn't matter who requires it um if they're trying to breach your informed consent um it's illegal period um the health the i was going to say the um yeah the public health act supersedes the privacy legislation in bc so i mean i would cite the, the the privacy legislation as well that would be the um i'll just tell you this in passing right now there's the uh the personal information protection act pipa personal information protection act and then there's the um the freedom of information and protection of privacy act as well but but as i said those go away if the you know the uh chief medical officer of health says they go away in an emergency unfortunately because of the section 53. in ontario we have um we have numerous pieces of legislation which protect us and are not superseded by any kind of public health related stuff um, we have also it's called the freedom of information and protection of privacy act there's a municipal version of that municipal freedom of and protection of privacy act then there's the very powerful Personal Health Information Protection Act because the fines are very, very high. We're talking $200,000 with jail time. Um, and medical information under that act is defined as a donation of a bodily substance. Um, and so donation means it's, you know, you're not paid for it. Obviously donation means no one, had, no one put a gun to your head to obtain it. And then a section, that's a section four, section 18 of that act, it says consent is needed and there can't be any coercion or deception involved in obtaining that consent. So that's what we have in Ontario. We have more rights with respect to that. Uh, there's other provinces, as, as I said, that don't have that. Um, Alberta doesn't, I don't believe be, uh, Saskatchewan does. No, Nova Scotia had a consent legislation until 2010, then repealed it. They do have good privacy legislation, but but they don't have the consent legislation. So, um, but there are various court precedents, Supreme Court precedents like Hop v. Lep. Um, I could put that in, in the chat window here. And what, what else do we have? Um, yeah, that, that's, that's a big one with respect to informed consents. The first one in 1980, which weighed in on, for, in, on informed consent. Um, there's also, there are court of appeal precedents. There's one that I really like in Ontario called Fleming v. Reed from 1991. Um, and then there's another one. I'm sorry, I'm thinking if I forgot one of them. Um, well, another one that I like very much is about consent in general. It was a sex, sexual assault case. It went to the Supreme Court in 19, 1999. It's called, I think it's called, It's I think it's pronounced, it's called Ewanchuk. I just don't want to mispronounce it. Uh, or not miss, I mean, misspell it. I believe it's called Ewanchuk, E W E N C H U K. And, um, and that involves, um, consent within the context of the criminal code to an assault. And that's section 265 of the criminal code. So that's very important because that it, it goes over the law of consent going back to literally to 1770. That's a hundred years before Canada uh, came into existence. So there's a lot there with respect to the common law, with respect to the court decisions um, going back like through centuries of law. And, and all of a sudden they just like literally over the past four or five weeks, they were like, no, nah, that doesn't exist anymore. It's silly. It's absolutely silly. I don't know how any courts are going to ever side with, um, with forcing some sort of an Amer experimental medical treatment, of course, provided that there's evidence showing that this stuff is absolutely ridiculous it's completely illegal there's the safety and efficacy long term are just completely unknown they cannot be known because of the um there's uh and i, I should yeah i should look at um just very briefly because you just put that on the screen right now if i oh it's you uh I, okay let me just um 
I got to spell you and check correctly because I, I spell it using E instead of an A. It's you and Chuck. Yeah, sorry, just you should, you're going to have to put that up again. But um, yeah, these are, these are, um, the Fleming v. Reed is a court of appeal precedent for Ontario. BC, I'm sure, I'm sure has its own court of appeal precedent regarding informed consent. Um, yes. And, uh, and then what else do I have here? Um, I mean, there's so much, there's so many weapons we have to fight back with. Um, and people just are not aware of it. So um, I, there's also, so I mentioned the, the consent legislation. I mentioned the privacy legislation. I mentioned the health legislation, the health, public health act or the health protection and promotion act in Ontario. There's also the H occupational health and safety act. Now this is something I do not know what it says for, for BC, but in Ontario, um, it, they've been citing this a lot saying to provide a safe workplace but they're selectively looking at it. They're, they're saying, well, we have to provide a safe workplace. But meanwhile, it says in there at section 28, subsection three, for any kind of a medical surveillance program, like requiring everyone to disclose their vaccination status, requires the employee's consent. And then section 63, subsection two of that act, of that Occupational Health and Safety Act in Ontario, it talks about you know, disclosure of you know, personal health information without your consent. And there are heavy penalties for that. So they're, they're saying, well, we're going to obey part of that act and the rest of the act, we're just going to throw it out because we don't want to obey it. So I said, I said, I used the word lawlessness earlier. That's where we are. In Ontario, there's also something called the Regulated Health Professions Act. There's sort of stuff there. I mentioned all the provinces have a human rights code. Generally, though, though you want to stay away from that because the onus is on the party that is that wants you to take some sort of a medical treatment, undergo some sort of a medical intervention, the onus is on them to seek your consent. No. The onus is not on no. you to seek an exemption. It simply does no. not exist. No. The exemption is something that you do not need no. to require from someone. No. You need to, they need to ask you for your consent. That's the bottom line. And, um, and so, uh, so I, so that's, uh, something that they're they're trying to steer stuff to the human rights code um whether it's it doesn't matter what province you're in i, I just saw an opinion from from the bc human rights commissioner or uh the, from the human rights commission not the committee yeah someone from the human rights commission saying that um that they can take your personal health information and they're probably correct um but what about a discrimination they, they the human rights commission in bc has been better a lot better than our useless human rights commission here they're ba they basically saying we have full discrimination is permitted you don't want to get a medical treatment full against your will experimental treatment unproven like over the long term we don't know the material risks or adverse effects over the long term but you know what they can discriminate against you all you want so it's 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 turned into garbage legislation and they're not going to help you so i would avoid the human rights commission with respect to this um and and you do help unless you are absolutely committed and you're going to do all the work and research you're going you're going to you're going to 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 um you know spend a lot of time and you're in in terms of you know time and resources energy all of that and do all the work and i do know some very committed people in, including some in bc who've done a very very good job and i expect them to prevail but for the most part people who go into any kind of legal proceeding without um, representation. They just do it by themselves because they can. It's like stepping into a boxing ring with someone who's not necessarily a professional, but someone who's, you know, they've been through a few boxing matches and you're just stepping into the ring with them. You are going to get knocked out, period. So I would strongly recommend against it. Avoid the Human Rights Commission in general, the Human Rights Tribunals, because they're not courts. Um, you want to get into court, people, the reason why we are still here 18, 19 months later is because people who could have gone to court and had a really good cases didn't go to court. So you don't want to avoid court if you can and get good counsel. And I can certainly, that's something I'd like to help arrange with people just like I have with, with Adam, with his constitutional challenge. And then, then um, what else do we have uh, in terms of, you know, things that can help you? Um, there's also 
I, I mentioned all these various um, civil liability um, uh, provisions, like there, there are Supreme Court decisions, one's on civil fraud, another one's on negligent misrepresentation, another, another one's on gross negligence. Those are very important going down the line when you can prove this stuff because there have to be damages and you have to be able to prove it. We're not there yet, but you know, there's going to be civil liability, no question. Federally, and this applies all across Canada. Well, one of the first one does not apply all across Canada, just federal federal government or federally regulated industries like banking and railroads and um, airlines, things like that, is the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. So that's for anyone who's federally regulated or work who works for the federal government. And they're obsessed with consent. It's, I believe it's section 4.3 in the set schedule one. You can just look, you can pull up this act. PIPEDA, P-I-P-E-D-A is the short form. You can look this up easily if you're a federally regulated employee and you can look and see what the consent required is. And they're obsessed with it, as I said. It's, it's, it's really, really hashed out. And it's very clear about how it applies and how important consent is. The government, by the way, tried to rewrite this act before before calling election did not because they died on the order paper but they tried to rewrite it with something called bill c11 so no less tyrannical than bill c10 they wanted to eliminate the um uh the criminal the quasi criminal provisions that would land you in court to put it into a into a tribunal which would eliminate your rights and also make it so that they can with any one person's life being potentially on the line not not defined in some sort of a gray emergency area, um, they can suspend your privacy rights. So that's how dangerous that was, but it, but it didn't pass. I'm sure they're going to try to to, to bring, bring sub, uh, very similar, the same legislation for this session of parliament, which is just reconvened. Um, there's, so that's with the privacy legislation. And I've named quite a few privacy acts here. I mean, there's the BC ones. There's two there. There's two here. There's actually three in Ontario. There's other privacy provisions and other acts there's the health protection and promotion act here which which says no coercion of professionals and um no you know the no one can be compelled to provide a bodily sample without their consent so there's consent there's privacy all that stuff is just heavily entrenched in our law there's also something called and i'm sh i'm sure a lot of people have heard about this recently um the genetic non-discrimination act um, it is, people have referred to it as Bill S-201, which is what it was called in 2017 before it was passed into law. Now it's called the Genetic Non-Discrimination Act. Uh, this requires written consent for um, taking uh, any type of or doing a, a test, a genetic test, which would completely encompass the PCR tests. That is the, not the rapid antigen tests that, you know, there's two types of tests. There's the ra rapid antigen test and the PCR test. The PCR test is a genetic test by definition. I mean, it fits almost, it fits almost all of the um, criteria for genetic tests under this act. This is, this was only passed in 2017, as I said, uh, uh, 2017, as I said, and it's something where it's probably the only useful thing that the government has done, that this tyrannical government has done since they came into power. So it's a very useful act. It has very heavy criminal penalties, like 300,000 plus fines, dollar fines, plus some um, uh, uh, jail time. And it, it's very, very serious. And it's, it applies all across Canada. Then there's also the criminal code. And the criminal code applies all across Canada. Um, there's various sections in here, like uh, organizational liability under sections 21 to 23, criminal negligence section, sections 219 to 221, assault, especially assault without consent, which I told you about you and Chuck at 265 and 266 is penalties, 269, um, it, that is um, unlawful bodily harm, 269.1 torture. I know that sounds like I'm reaching. It sounds pretty severe, but if you read the definition, it fully applies in subsection three. It talks about no defense, uh, just following orders in 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 in, a, in an emergency. Any type of emergency is not a defense under the criminal code with respect to that provision. 380 is fraud, and 423 is intimidation. So that's all there. And then the last thing I would say, and I and then I'll go into specifically for businesses, just to kind of put a bow on it. But, um, you know, to be, to be clear about what they're forcing here, um, they're forcing uh, vaccine candidates 
Um, they're not even called vaccines, they're called drugs. They're specifically not called vaccines. Um, there are numerous ones under phase three clinical trials in the US under the FDA. The earliest one is set to be completed October 27, 2022. The most deployed candidate, Pfizer's, is set to be completed July 30th, 2023. We cannot possibly know what the long-term um, adverse effects or material risks are until these, uh, these, these clinical trials are being completed. So it is not possible technically to even provide informed consent if you're, if you're saying, well, I, I just don't know what the long-term effects are, so I can't take it. I choose not to. That is your right. Under the law, they, they're, they're trying to impose an experimental medical treatment. By definition, it is experimental. Who cares what kind of words they use for you know, approval, authorization? Uh, they, they technically have been, these Pfizer's and Moderna's um, candidates have been approved in Canada. Um, they've been added to Schedule D over food and drugs uh, regulations. Um, and, but so what? We, they can approve it all they want. We do not know what the long-term effects are. Even if it was properly done, we still, two years is not enough time. Two, two and a half years is not still not enough time to ascertain the long-term effects. There'd be many drugs and chemicals. Um, like, you know, we know about DDT being sprayed on kids. Like literally you can see the videos from the fifties. Um, there's PFOA, which is the surf surfactant used to declump Teflon, which is dumped in our waterways. That's still affect. It's in 99% of every living being's blood, including ours right here. Um, there's also, uh, um, um, what, what else? Um, ketone, which is, you know, causes prostate cancer, in anyone who's, who's exposed to it. And then there's, there's, there's drugs, there's resulin for a diabetes drug, which, 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 which killed a lot of people. We know about asbestos and all of that and lead and things, the tetraethyl lead. And then of course there's, you know, Vioxx is the really big one. 200,000 people had heart attacks, strokes, and or died from it, even though that went through a rigorous approval process. We all know about thalidomide in the fifties. That's one of the first ones, which, which, um, you know, got exposed by whistleblower. And then there's Fen Fen, um, which was from the nineties, a weight loss combination, which, um, cause severe and you know problems with people's heart valves so i mean these these things have gone through rigorous approval processes and they still ended up you know harming or killing a lot of people in this case we they've they've gotten rid of all of the um of the of the safety protocols so in terms of well what have they done here um the i told you about the dates and all that um, there's an in, there's interim orders governing this stuff in, in Canada, but then they've approved this stuff. And irrespective of that, I told you that we just don't, no one can say they actually know for sure. Um, there are these new drug submissions and regulatory authorizations for these products that are online. And it says like very matter of factly in both authorizations, it's in both of them. It says an important limitation of the data is the lack of information on the long-term safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. So it actually says that. And then in the actual, the food and drugs regulations, they don't, funnily enough, it says there, the regulatory authorization, it says vaccine, but then in the, in the food and drugs regulations, it doesn't use the term vaccine even once. It says drugs, COVID drugs, and, and they've removed stuff like detailed, like this is a requirement, detailed reports of the tests made to establish the safety of the new drug for the purpose and under the conditions of the use dem, uh, recommended and substantial evidence of the clinical effectiveness of the new drug for the purpose and under the conditions of use recommended, Can, the claims to be made for the new drug, the contraindications and side effects of the new drug, that's all gone. You don't need that anymore because they just, they, they amended the food and drugs regulations, which doesn't need to go through any kind of debate. They just did it. They just, with a stroke of a pen, they changed the stuff in terms of a designated COVID-19 drug does not apply. So they removed all the safety protocols. It's like removing the ABS and airbags and um, uh, the kind of glass that they put in the windshield. So it shatters instead of comes in, in chunks and can, can take your head off. Like that's what the automobile glass used to be made out of. So that's all that's where we are. I mean, you, they're, they're asking to take something which um, cannot possibly be proven to be safe or efficacious at this point in time. So, um, so people have, there have been questions here and I'm going to go into the, into restaurants, about how you can, you know, safely comply with the law, but also say that you can respect people's um, willingness to not consent. Um, but, but uh, one, one thing here is about, um, links to uh, you know people about information 
Um, all I can say is I, I, I'm going to go into this a little bit later, but I, I do give these discussions in defiance and you can book in and, and attend uh, in person or if you're in BC, you can attend remotely. And I give them, I'm supposed to give them a couple of times a week, but uh, I just gave one yesterday. The next one will be likely on October 7th. So it's unfortunately because um, my uh, partner who, who does all the booking, she's going to be in Montreal for a few days. So we can't do it. Um, and um, so that's something where I, I will give you details at the end. Um, another question here is a, a person in BC cannot say it's against my privacy. I would say you absolutely could and should, uh, regardless of what the public health orders say. You should say, sorry, I have privacy. And uh, they may deny that to you and just, sorry, I do, I do not consent. I have privacy. I'm not giving that to you. And you could even say like, um, yeah, I, I just don't subscribe to the public health orders. I understand them. Um, but I don't subscribe to them. I don't believe they're constitutional. I believe this is an unreasonable um, search and seizure. And we're talking about um, very, you know, personal health information. Um, if they do this, where does it end, right? It doesn't end anywhere, just so you not understand. There's the certificate of vaccination ID is what COVID really stands for. I've been saying this since, since um, April of 2020. People thought I was absolutely paranoid, yet on Five days ago, that's when it went into effect here officially, is they literally call it a, a vaccine certificate. So it's a certificate of vaccination ID. There, There is an ID required. There is ID required. So this is papers, please. Make no mistake about it. This is what my family went through and my family died for. And the same thing with, you know, I'm sure quite a, quite a few viewers and listeners. Um and, uh, you know, there's a comment from Jamie about slavery, be, slavery being legal at one time. And there's another one, which is probably the most important one, which is a, a Latin term. Um, inter arma enum silent legis means in the times of war, the law goes silent. So we're living in this garbage emergency scenario, whereas, it, you know, everyone I'm sure can plainly point out, if people were not forced to wear masks or weren't wearing masks, didn't watch the TV, wouldn't know there's a pandemic. So when, and, and something that blows people's minds, I mean, say this to someone who, who believes that this is a real pandemic, tell them that the ab average um, age of mortality from COVID, whether, however you want to define that is, is actually higher than the average life expectancy in this country. So you actually live longer with COVID than without COVID. Say that to people and watch their heads explode. Yeah. Cause that's true. That's easily verifiable. Yeah. yeah. Chris, before we wrap up, I was just wondering yeah. if you can touch on ways that businesses can comply, but not comply. Yes. Specifically, you mentioned restaurants. I yes. have seen um, businesses putting up a sign at the front saying seat yourself. So they kind of bypass mm -hmm. that stage of asking the questions. Is there anything else um, yes. they can do? Well, this, this, this health care consent and care facility admission act, it's the point is there's consent is needed for any type of medical intervention. If, if it's, it's, it's not unreasonable at all to think and see it, have a court down the road, not now, but down the road, um, say that, you know, someone's informed consent was breached because someone decided to force them to consent to an experimental medical treatment. If, if you were forced and look at it this way, um, I, I I just named a bunch of drugs and chemicals, things that were that were considered safe, that went through these rigorous safety trials, and they they still harmed and killed a lot of people. So I don't think it's unreasonable to say that. To, I mean, we already know for a fact, for an absolute undisputed fact, that I mean, the VAERS database is bursting at the seams in the United States. The Euro European equivalent is the same. We're talking tens of thousands of deaths already. We're talking about mil over a million people who have been injured and, and more in a few months than in over 20 years combined with all, all the vaccines combined. So we know that for a fact. Um, we don't know going forward what will happen, how many more people will be injured or, or die, how many people's immune systems will be compromised going for the long term. We, just, we don't know that. But let's say down the road, um, five years from now, uh, there's there are links that the causative medical links trace between the vaccine candidates and people's permanent disabilities or even deaths. Um, what happens then? People want 
recourse, right? People, it is assumed that there will be a change in terms of, you know, how people conduct themselves, just as there always has been, right? I mean, we had Japanese internment and horrible things like that. Um, you know, what was done to the indigenous peoples and all of that, I mean, slavery, everything. I mean, we can talk about that. But the point is, I mean, eventually people turn around and say, this is wrong. So what's the recourse? What's the recourse? And the recourse, of course, is um, talking about the criminal liability, talk, because that doesn't go away. There's no limitation period for criminal liability. Civil liability there is, but then as soon as it, there's a link determined, then you can sue. So then the two-year period, um, the, the clock starts ticking then when you can actually establish there's causation and you can sue. You can prove damages. So, so that's some time away. And then, of course, there's the provincial laws as well, the provincial laws that are broken. In Ontario, there's a whole slew of them, certainly less in BC, but I've not looked at BC as anywhere as closely as Ontario is. I mean, I just, I really haven't. So there's, there's going down the road, people, all business owners can say simply this, that looking at the law as it's written in BC, there's this Healthcare Consent and Care Facility Admission Act. There's, it requires informed consent, plain as day. And if I'm if I violate that, I'm going to be liable. I'm going to be viable. I can be convicted in a court. So there's that. Yes, I know there's public health orders and there's privacy laws. Maybe the privacy laws apply. Maybe they don't. But there are penalties, and I could be I could be I can face those penalties, and I don't want to. I'm trying. To, so you can so a business owner can can legitimately say, um, please provide proof of vaccination, but also. Um, you must indicate your consent. And if you don't consent, you don't have to provide it. There's nothing that requires someone to do something against their consent. Nothing. I don't care what the Public Health Act says. Without someone's consent, they may not compel someone to undergo a medical procedure. It just, they can't do it. In Ontario, it's even more strongly worded. And, they, and, and as I said, I mentioned those Supreme Court precedents and the Court of Appeal precedent here about informed consent. Um, people can say, I don't want to get sued. I don't want to be charged under provincial acts. I don't want to potentially face criminal liability under the criminal code. So I'm doing my best to comply with the law as it's written. I'm trying to comply with the public health orders. The public health order says proof mu must be provided. But at the same time, I know there, if you do not consent, you do not need to undergo any type of medical treatment of any kind. And, and anything that violates that is a violation of law. So business owners are put in an impossible position. They could have done this. They could have amended the coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, measures act in BC. They could have amended the, um, uh, the reopening Ontario act here. Um, instead they, they made it this week directive six and uh, regulation um, 364.20 under the re reopening Ontario act. They cobbled together two pieces of executive level legislation, subordinate legislation, that is under the reopening Ontario Act, or under the Health Act, the Health Protection and Promotion Act, and and the Chief Medical Officer of Health doesn't even have those powers here. The legislature said you may not compel someone to provide a bodily s substance without their consent. I mean, that, and it only applies to the healthcare field. Yet they're, they're trying to apply this everywhere. It simply doesn't exist. I mean, it's a legal fiction. I mean, people use that term. It literally in Ontario, there is no mandate with respect to employers and employees, with respect to patrons. There is a mandate, but but anyone can say, well, listen, the rest of the laws, as they're written in Ontario today, that are made by the legislature, they're not being unmade or sort of exempted in any way by the legislature. They they allow me to have provide consent or not provide consent as I see fit. That has not changed. So by saying this, that that they must compel patrons to do th to do this, it does if you don't do not consent in Ontario, they can't do anything. And business owners in Ontario have you know the same way they have more rights to say well i am complying with this regulation 36420 but if people don't want to provide consent i have no right to turn them away because the law says if i do or someone ends up getting the experimental medical treatment because i told them to and i could be brought up on charges provincially i could be sued and i could be brought up criminally on charges later so they're put in an businesses are put in, especially in Ontario, are put in an, in an absolutely impossible, irreconcilable position. 
it's it's a, the conflict of law is it cannot be resolved it is it's impossibility of dual compliance this is, these are the legal terms impossibility of dual compliance and frustration of purpose i mean it's a complete conflict of law so this is something where i want to go over all of this with people in my um uh, and i you, there's the 39 pages of legislation and all this stuff that we go over um, we are going to be doing this on October 7th. I'm going to provide um, my 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 right hand's name who does all the bookings. Her name is Cindy Harris at 416-657-7777. Uh, and at, and then pro, um, what is it? Uh, breathe free. I'm typing this out so it can be put on the screen. Uh, protonmail.com. Yeah, so I just typed this out here, and um, and yes, this is uh, something where people will will get the kind of the full scoop. I mean, I've this is this is like the really very 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 light version. The one that I give is is comprehensive and goes into specific scenarios. But the main thing is people have to know precisely. They have to have all this legislation, and they have to know what to cite and how to cite it. It's not complicated. And as I said, regarding, you know, if you are actually, you know, subject to, um, you know, an offense notice, you know, a ticket, they'll never convict because of this, of this irreconcilable conflict of law. They have to have a prima facie case beyond reasonable doubt. Well, there, there is no prima facie case because there's a conflict of law and it can't be resolved. So you, you can say you're, and legitimately say like, Provide proof of vaccination, but if people say no because I don't consent, there's you can't. There's nothing the business owner can do. They can, they can go okay. Please have a seat. Now masks, on the other hand, uh, they're in the lockdowns. That's a different story because the lockdowns are in the law, and masks are in the law, and they haven't been challenged. We challenged uh, lockdowns. We haven't been heard yet. The masks. Um, have not really been challenged anywhere. That's only been done at the human rights level, but the actual legislation is not being challenged. So um, until they're challenged, the masks and distancing and things like that will remain the law in Ontario and the law in BC. Um, but with respect to um, other provisions, lockdowns, that is subject to uh, at least our court challenge right now. And... Um, but now they're doing this in addition with proof of vaccination, which I've been warning people about for a long time. So, and of course, everyone is being subject to some kind of severe coercion at work. A lot of people are, and that's not legal by any stretch of imagination because they could have put that, in, definitely in Ontario, they, they had this opportunity to put in employers and employees in this regulation and they didn't do it. They just put in, uh, an uh, a company, a business, or a patron. But the, so there's a sort of like the customer um, vendor relationship, but not with respect to our service provider relationship, not with respect to the employer employee relationship. But the, but the way that the um, labor laws are written, the employment laws are written, is they can fire someone for any reason. You know, they can not like the way you pronounce words or something like that, and they can just fire you. They can fire you for any reason as long as it's not a, a ground of discrimination. They can fire you. That's it. So, so that is highly problematic, and and that is the law as it exists. So, if you do get fired or do you do get on unpaid leave, there are various employment lawyers you can get to maximize the amount of. Um, of severance you get, I would advise paying up front for their services. So you get the entire severance rather than you only get like half or less than half when you, when, when, you know, they do it for free, essentially on spec and they take a huge chunk of it. But there are a lot of employment lawyers who are taking cases like these. And one of, one of them is Lior Samfiru. Um, I'll like, I'll write that out. This guy's been very, he's been really out there. So I'll just put his name in there. He's done videos on YouTube. Um, and yeah, he did one, but an hour long one saying, you know, come to me if this happens to you, if you're put in an impossible situation, but that's, that's really for non-unionized employees for unionized employees you either have to go through your union and, and it completely, you know, and make it imperative that they represent you. And the other thing is if they don't do that, you have to go around them for go their, for union representation, get a good lawyer who does labor relations 
Um, you know, for people who are really hell bent on doing that, I mean, I certainly have some people who do it, but so far, I don't think anyone's really been committed to doing anything. No. So, yeah. With all this, Chris, this is, um, you're covering this in your, um, is it a webinar or a Zoom? Well, no, it's it's in person, but then we also have, um, we have the video conference portion for people who can't make it in person. Oh, perfect. So, um, yeah. so you can, you can expand on all of these ideas um, and we put up all the contact information and uh, that was great. We're going to, we're going to have to wrap it up. We're kind of yep. at the end of the show. I was going to ask a bunch of questions, but you, you seem to answer them as you go. So we just let you keep going because you, I, I've talked to you many a time, so I know you're very thorough. So that's why we didn't interject a lot. And um, you covered so much ground here and I know, you know, so much more, um, but it's uh, yeah. Yeah. You're, a wealth of knowledge and like you were saying when people go to challenge us and they're in the court is it's not a really difficult task you just need to find what you're standing on and you could even literally read it from the paper um you don't have to recite it and and have it into memorized as well as no yourself. you shouldn't you shouldn't literally, attempt to memorize it yeah you can literally read it straight off the paper and that's what makes it easy once you know what your defense is you can just literally read it out so Thank you so That's much it. for being here, Chris. Thank you, Thanks, Jamie. Chris. Thank you, Kimberly. We'll have to do a part two. There's so much information. We can even get into a lot more. So thank you for your time. We know how busy you are. And, and, I, and I'll just say one, one thing to kind of close it off, which is everything, every type of government, every type, especially not just including, but especially tyranny rests on mass consent. So I, I've been saying this since I believe it was um, May of 2020 which is I do not consent, I will not comply, I will not obey, I will never give in. If people, if people adopt that, this, this will resolve in our favor. If people cave, and I know a lot of people have caved, um, it will not resolve in our favor. It's up to us to stand up to it and absolutely never give in. Thank you very much. Exactly. If we all just grew a set and just went about our days and and just ignored all these things that they put on us they would have to change it all in a in a heartbeat That's thank it. you again so much chris thank you thank you bye thank you. excellent everybody have a great night